So you're looking at, um, like, this is life's alphabet, right? And so I, I also want to make a very quick link now to your first question, the mm-hmm. tree of life. Um, when when we link, when we try to understand ancient languages, right, or the cultures of the, the or the cultures uh, that use these extinct languages, uh, we start with the modern languages, right? So we look at um, Indo-European languages and and try to understand certain words and make trees um, to understand. You know, this, this is what uh, Slavic uh, word is for snow. Something like snake. Now we this jump to languages that humans spoke. Humans human spoke. History. Exactly. So we make trees to understand what is the original ancestor. Uh, what did they use to say snow? And if you have a lot of cultures who use the word snow, you can imagine that uh, it was snowy. That's why they needed that word. It's the same thing for <laughs> biology, right? Yeah. So if if they have some, if we understand some function about that enzyme, we can understand the environment that they lived in it's it's the similar it's similar in that sense so now you're looking at the alphabet for of life in this case it's not 20 or 25 letters it's you have four letters so what is really interesting that stands out to me when i look at this it, it, on the outer shell you're looking at the 20 amino acids that compose life right mm-hmm. the one the methionine that you see that's the start so the start is always the same Got to it. me, that is fascinating that all life starts with the same start. There is no other start code. So you sent the uh, AG, you know, AUG to the cell. That when that information arrives, the translation knows, all right, I got to start, function is coming. Mm-hmm. The Following this is a chain of information until the stop code arrives, which are highlights it in black squares. So for people just listening, we're looking at a standard RNA color table organized in a wheel. There's an outer shell and there's an inner shell all using the four letters that we're talking about. And with that, we can compose all of the amino acids and there's a start and there's a stop. And presumably you put together the, the with these letters, you walk around the wheel to put together the words, the sentences that yeah, make- Yeah, the words, the sentences. And um, you, uh, again, you get one start, you get three, st- there are three different ways to stop this, one way to start it. And for each letter, you have multiple options. So you say you have a code A, the second code can be another A. And even if you mess that up, you still can rescue yourself. So you can get, a, for instance, I'm looking at the lysine, the K. You get an A and you get an A and then you get an A that gives you the lysine, mm-hmm. right? But if, if you get an A and if you get an A and I get a G, you still get the lysine. So th- there are <laughs> yeah. uh, different combinations. So even if there's an error, we don't know if these are selected because they were er- er- erroneous and somehow they got locked down. We don't know if there's a mechanism behind this to, or we, we certainly don't know this definitively. But this is the informatic uh, part of this. And notice that the, the colors, and in some tables too, the colors will be, coded in a way that um, the the type of the nucleotide can be similar chemically. Uh, but the, the point is that you will still end up with the same amino acids or something similar to it, even if you mess up the code. Do we understand the mechanism, how natural selection interplays with this resilience to error? So, like Which errors result in the same uh, output, like the same function and which don't? Uh, which actually results in a dysfunction, or which are we understand to some degree the, the how translation and the rest of the cell work together, yeah. how an error at the translation level, this is the really core level, can impact entire cell, but we understand very little about the evolutionary mechanisms behind the selection of the system. It's thought to be as one of the hardest problems in biology, and it is still the dark side of biology. We, even though it is so essential, so th- th- this is, uh, yeah, you're looking at the language of life, so to speak, and, and how it can f- found ways rather to uh, tolerate its own mistakes. So the entire phylogenetic tree can be like uh, deconstructed with this wheel of l- language. Because all the final letters, those are that's the 20 amino acids, that's our alphabet. Yeah. They are all brought together with these bits of information, right? 
so you when you look at the genes, you're looking at those four letters. When you look at the proteins, you're looking at the 20 amino acids, uh, which may be a little easier way to track the information when we create um, the tree. So using this language, we can describe all life that's lived on Earth. Uh, I one, wish. One, one perspective. It's not, it's, we are not that uh, good at it yet, right? So, so in theory, this is one way to look at life on Earth. If you're a biologist and you want to understand how life evolved uh, from a molecular perspective, this would be the way to do it. And and this is what nature um, narrowed its code down to. So when we think of nitrogen, when we think of carbon, when we think of sulfur, it, it's all in this, that the, all these nucleotides are built based on those elements. And this is fundamentally the informatic perspective. On exactly. Okay. That's, that's the informatic perspective. And it's important to emphasize that this is not engineered by humans. Mm -hmm. This is, this evolved by itself. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> humans didn't invent this just because we we're just uh, describing, we're trying to find, trying to describe the language of yeah. life. It's, it appears to be a highly optimized chemical and information code. Um, it, it may indicate that a great deal uh, of uh, chemical evolution and uh, and and this may indicate that a lot of selection pressure and Darwinian evolution happened with prior to the rise of last universal common ancestor because this is uh, almost a bridge that connects the earliest cells to the last universal common ancestor. Okay, can you describe what the heck you just said? <laughs> uh, so this mechanism evolved before the what common ancestor? So the, there's the, the last universal common ancestor. Yes. So ancestor. when we talk about the tree, when we think about the root, if you uh, yeah. ideally uh, included all the living information or all the available information that comes from living organisms on your tree, then it on the root of your tree lies the last universal common ancestor, Luca. Right. Why last? Last uh, universal. Because the earlier universe, it also had trees, but they all died off. We call it the last because it is sort of the first one that we can track. Uh, because we cannot, we don't know what we cannot track, right? There's so one, there was one organism that started the whole thing. It's more like a, I would think of it as more like a population, a group of organisms than okay, a single. Okay, hold on a second. I tweeted this, so I want to know the accuracy of my tweet. All right. <laughs> Um, sometimes early in the morning, I, I tweet very pothead-like things. I said uh, that we all evolved from one common ancestor that was a single cell organism 3.5 billion years ago, uh, something like this. How how true is that tweet? Do I need to delete it? No, that's actually correct. I mean... Uh, I, I think, of course, there's a lot to say, which is like we we don't know exactly. Uh, but what to what degree is that the the single organism aspect is that true um, versus multiple organisms? Um, do you want me to be brutally honest? <laughs> yes, please. This <laughs> um, so... there's still time. <laughs> this this is how we get like caveats to tweets. All right. Just... So first of all, it's not. Um... 3.5 is still a very conservative estimate. That's In which direction? Uh, I would say it's 3.8 th is probably safer to say at this point. A bunch of people said it probably way before. If that. you put an approximately, I'll take that. I didn't. I just love the idea that I was once, first of all, as a single organism, I was once a cell. Well, you're still as, you're a group of cells. No, but I started from a single cell. Me, Lex. You mean like you versus Luca? Are you relating to Luca right now? No, or no, no. You I'm relating a, to my like your Lex, own development. My own development. I started from a single cell. It's like it yes. like built up and stuff. Okay, that for, and then so that's a, for single biological organism. And then from an evolutionary perspective, the Luca, like I start like my ancestor is a single cell, and then here I am sitting half asleep, tweeting. Like I started from a single cell, evolved a ton of murder along the way to the, 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 this like brutal uh, search for adaptation through the, the 3.5 
1.8 billion years. So you, you defy the code of Douglas Adams. You are proud of your ancestors and you invite yes, them over 100%. to dinner and you invite them over to your Twitter. Yeah, so. and it's amazing that this intelligence, to the degree you can call it intelligence, emerged to be able to tweet whatever the heck I want. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost anyway. intelligence at the chemical level and this is also probably right. one of the first chemically intelligent system that evolved by itself in nature. Yeah, you, so you see that translation is a fundamentally like uh, intelligent mechanism. In, in its own way, and and again, the uh, if if we manage to figure out how to drive uh, life's evolution, um, in in it can if it can evolve uh, a sophisticated sort of informatic um, processing system like this you may ask yourself what might uh, chemical systems be capable of independently doing under different circumstances? Yeah, so like locally, they're intelligent locally. They don't need the rest of the shebang. Like they don't need the big they picture. They need, so that that's that's a great segue into what makes this biological, right? The, the heart of the cellular acti activities are translation. You kill translation, you kill the cell. Yes. You not only the translation itself. You kill uh, the component that initiates it. You kill the cell. You kill. You remove the component that elongates it. You kill the cell. So there are many different ways to disrupt this machinery. They all the part. All the parts are important. Now it it can vary across different organisms. We see variation between bacteria versus eukaryotes versus archaea, right? So it is not the same. Ex it's same exact steps, but it can get more crowded as we get closer to eukaryotes, for instance. But you are still computing about um, 20 amino acids per second, right? This is this is what you're generating every second. That single machinery is doing 20 a second? 20 a, 21 for bacteria, I believe eight for eukaryotes or nine. 21 a second. I mean, that's super inefficient or super efficient, depending on how you think about it. I think it's great. I mean, I can- Yeah, but it's way slower than a computer. Could generate through simulation. I I think if you can show me a computer that does this, we are done here. Well, this is the big. This includes the five things, <laughs> not just. But I could show you a computer that's doing the informatic, right? I, like yes, you can show me that, but you right. cannot show me the one that has all. For but, now. For now. I will ask you about probably what uh, AlphaFold, right? Uh, the, I think the more we learn about, and this this is why early life. An origin is also very fascinating and applicable to many different disciplines. Uh, there is no way you see this the way we just described it unless you think about early life and early geochemistry and uh, earliest emergent systems. 